History and Freedom by Theodore Adorno. This is lecture 23. And 10 Knees of Freedom, February 9th, 1965. It will perhaps not be entirely unproductive for the problems that we are exploring if we were to ask a question that Kant would undoubtedly have condemned as a genuine act of les majesté. This question is... What possible interest might the human subject have in emphasizing that his own freedom is a positive given? It will then immediately become obvious. I am well aware that such a psychological approach is a metabasis ace allogenos, a transition to another kind. But it will become clear to you why I resort to it. It will then become obvious that human subject's interest in his freedom is narcissistic. By this I mean that the suggestion that human beings are merely creatures of nature and hence in the last analysis automata as Descartes in Amalia are supposed to be is felt to be a major slight. In general humanity as a species feels an extraordinary re revulsion from everything that might remind it of its own nature or its own animal nature. A revulsion which I strongly suspect to be deeply relate, related to the persistence of its very real animality. Probably one of the most intractable problems of Kant's conception of man and human nature lies in his attempt to differentiate it, differentiate it, and together, and together with it, man's dignity in everything that involves, and to mark it off from animality. We can readily understand this interest historically if we picture to ourselves the indescribable efforts and the sacrifices that it must have cost human beings in the course of their development to muster the strength to master their inner and outer nature. For it was only thanks to these efforts and these sacrifices that it became possible to distinguish themselves from nature, and that this strength could be reflected back to them as a divinely gifted quality, the quality of freedom. It is, it is a remarkable and striking fact that even though Kant would have found such considerations in Athema, he was able, if not to illuminate, theoretically, the secret of this interest in freedom, the subject's narcissistic interest in freedom, at least to let it slip out in passing. This can be seen in a passage in the groundwork of the metaphysic of morals, in the section entitled, How is a Categorical Imperative Possible?, in the course of a discussion of the general of the possibility of a practical philosophy in general, he expresses himself in such a way that what I have called narcissistic interest breaks through to the surface. I should like to show you this remarkable passage. The he that Kant uses here is the subject as such. Significantly, he at once identifies this subject as a scoundrel in order to show that even such a scoundrel, needless to say, the archaic sound of the word, will not have escaped you, that even such a scoundrel cannot dispense with the supposition of freedom. By pointing to the driving force at work, he gives expression to this narcissism in all innocence. I hasten to add, by such a wish, he, the scoundrel, shows that having a will free from sensuous impulses, he transfers himself in thought into an order of things quite different from that of his desires in the field of sensibility. For from the fulfillment of this wish, he can expect no gratification of his sensuous desires, and consequently no state which would satisfy any of his actual or even conceivable inclinations, since by such an expectation the very idea which elicited the wish would be deprived of its superiority. All he can expect is a greater inner worth of his own person. This better person he believes himself to be when he transfers himself to the standpoint of a member of the intelligible world. Intellig intelligible world here means the world we can understand. In other words, the world of freedom. He is involuntarily constrained to do so by the idea of freedom. That is, of not being dependent on determination by causes in the sensible world. And from this standpoint, he is conscious of possessing a good will, which, on his own admission, constitutes the law for the bad will belonging to him as a member of the sensible world a law of whose authority he is aware, even in transgressing it. The moral, I thought, is thus an I will for man as a member of an intelligible world. 
The necessity that is ascribed here to the consciousness of freedom is so peculiar because as something narcissistic, that is to say, as the mere consciousness of being a better person, it is defined by Kant in precisely the psychological manner that the anti-psychologism of the critique of practical reason ought to preclude. But we are now confronted with a curious fact in connection with this tremendous narcissistic need to assert one's own freedom and sovereignty. I believe that I am not exaggerating when I say that the impact of German idealism, the political and also the social impact of German idealism, would have been inconceivable without that element of narcissism. But what is remarkable is that this interest in freedom runs in tandem with the opposing interest, namely the denial of freedom. I remember how as a child my parents were shocked to hear a housemaid telling me that I had to do what I was told, and this doing what I was told was, pre was presented to me as a sort of categorical imperative, without its being explained to me why I had to do what I was told, and in what respect I had to do what I was told. Of course, this is the ideal of conformity that plays such a major role in bourgeois society, and that was originally determined by the coercion of the market economy. By this I mean that the man who produces for the market needs to adapt his supply to the prevailing demand, because otherwise he will not be able to dispose of his products. The idea was then projected onto nature in the shape of Darwinist biology, no doubt for good reason, since you will remember that history is an extension of natural history. And having been naturalized in the shape of Darwinism, the idea was reimported into the society from which it had sprung. Incidentally, an intellectual or social history of conformity would be a project that would really give us an insight into the very heart of bourgeois society, especially if we think of the theory of conformity as the dark side of the theory of freedom. The two theories are corollaries of each other, and between them they express the conflict that sustains bourgeois society itself. This conflict means, on the one hand, that human beings have to prove themselves through the work ethic. That is to say, they are evaluated in a double sense in terms of the socially useful work that they perform. They have to display independence, autonomy, and initiative. In other words, all the qualities that bourgeois modernity championed in opposition to feudal notions, whether those of beggars or of great lords. These, then, are the virtues of freedom. If the single, atomized, isolated individual fails to insist on his own being for himself and his own autonomy, if, in other words, he fails to prove himself as a free being, he will be punished socially. He will fall under the wheels in one way or another. On the other hand, however, the same individual must define himself as a being for others. He must constantly mutilate himself because society as a whole is unfree, because in its content society as a whole is a heteronomous thing as far as he is concerned, and because he can only assert himself by this process of adaptation. The difficulties, the theoretical difficulties connected with the concept of freedom ultimately represent something like an interiorization or sublimation of that very real conflict between the doctrines of freedom and conformity in bourgeois society itself. You can find a vulgarized version of this in the ideology of the contemporary culture industry. In my essay, Secondhand Superstition, which appears in Volume 2 of the Sociologica, I have shown in great detail, and this could easily be replicated with reference to the astrology columns in German magazines, the two pieces of advice always go together and mutually reinforce one another. On the one hand, there is the advice, stand on your own two feet, use your own initiative, take your courage in both hands. And on the other hand, keep in with your superiors. Don't be too cheeky. Don't make trouble. Don't try always to get your way. The pieces of advice are that are to be gleaned from the stars, which basically just reiterate what life imposes on human beings anyway merely attempt to strike a balance between the conflicting demands made on people between the morning and the afternoon or between or between the day and the evening in accordance with a two-phased temporal scheme. You can perhaps see this most clearly in the dominant American ideology in what is known as the American way of living. In this ideology we find cheek by jowl the demand for a rugged individualism that is to say, the energetic, unruly individual who is not afraid to use his elbows. And on the other hand, the insistence on adjustment. In other words, on the conforming individual, 
At the same time, there is a peculiar dialectic at work, in which, because force is at bottom, the principle governing society. The man with the most powerful elbows is generally the man who is also the best adjusted to society. We may say, and this is doubtless one of the reasons for the growing disenchantment with politics, that the trend, the general trend today, leans heavily towards the side of adjustment. Connected with this is the fact that, insofar as people truly are free and autonomous, as I have already tried to explain to you in one of the recent lectures, freedom overtaxes them, just as the insistence upon their freedom simultaneously flatters them, or has flattered them in the past. Today, in contrast, we may well ask whether people are as flattered to be told, you are free, be proud that you are free, as they have been for the past 150 or 200 years. I should like to bring your attention... I should like to bring to your attention a fact with which we shall have to concern ourselves. If the process of societalization continues to advance, and if therefore the elements of freedom that I have told you about are progressively swallowed up by the elements of adjustment, then freedom, and what we might call the impulses of freedom, spontaneous actions, will come to appear increasingly old-fashioned, or even archaic. This is not a superficial fact, and that is why I have launched out into these conceptual, or if you like, general historical observations. For it seems to be the case, and I note this in the first instance as just one of the crucial themes of a doctrine of freedom, that a certain archaic element is required for there to be such things as free impulses, or spontaneous modes of behavior that are not triggered by reasons. This stands in contrast to the entire philosophical tradition, especially since Spinoza, Leibniz, and Kant, in which freedom, free behavior, is equated with behavior in accordance with reason. This archaic element is a much older phenomenon, one that I should like to call an impulse. It is undoubtedly closely connected with mimetic phenomena. Mimetic behavior is not causally determined by objective factors, or factors that are seen to be objective, but involves instead an involuntary adjustment to something extramental. Because of its involuntary nature, there is something irrational about this adjustment that theories of freedom generally refuse to acknowledge, but which is part of the definition of freedom. This is something that I regard as crucial to what I want to say to you about freedom. The more the ego obtains control over itself and over nature, then the more it learns to master itself and the more questionable it finds its own freedom. This is because its archaic, uncontrolled reactions appear chaotic. We might almost go so far as to say that, while something like freedom becomes possible only through the development of consciousness, at the same time this very same development of consciousness effectively ensures that freedom is pushed back into the realm of archaic, mimetic impulse that is so, so essential to it. We might say then that the situation with freedom is like that of so many other things in the world in the sense that the more it is translated into the imagination, the more it distances itself from its own immediate reality. I say this only to show you that what is, at first sight, a historical or psychological conflict between freedom and conformity is, in fact, metapsychological. Psych metapsychological. That is to say, it reaches down into what we may designate as appropriate to the prehistory of individuation as such. The concept of freedom could not be formulated in the absence of recourse to something prior to the ego, to an impulse that is, in a sense, a bodily impulse that has not yet been subjected to the centralizing authority of consciousness, while on the other hand, its trajectory terminates in the strength of the ego itself. In other words, it contains a conflict within itself. When I speak of a dialectic of freedom, I hope that I have been able to show you that we are talking of dialectic in a very strict sense, that is to say of a contradictoriness that is integral to the concept we are investigating you know that Kant, and then post-Kantian philosophy, makes use of a concept that really holds the key to the concept of freedom, and that at the same time provides a starting point for post-Kantian idealism. This is the concept of spontaneity. When you read the critique of pure reason, you make the acquaintance of spontaneity as the consciousness's faculty for the activity of thought. In other words, everything that forms part of reason and the understanding is contrast to receptivity, or in contrast to receptivity, the ability to be affected to the passive qualities of sensibility.
I would ask you now to consider a question that goes beyond the so-called branches of philosophy, such as epistemology, metaphysics, and ethics, and that can justifiably be described as speculative. This is to inquire what Kant actually meant by spontaneity. If you do so, you will probably encounter a very similar duality in what he regarded as the most profound category of his philosophy to the one to be found in the concept of freedom, as I have just tried to demonstrate in the course of my attempt to give you a history of the individual. Thus, on the one hand, spontaneity is active, thinking behavior, and as such, active thinking behavior is something that Kant argues at length in the, dedu in the deduction of the pure concepts of understanding. It is this behavior by means of which something like a unity of consciousness comes into being, and with it the unity of the world. Thus, this spontaneity is evidently connected to the ego. It is the true determining factor of the fixed ego, identical with itself. It becomes a unity as the unity of the activity that it is able to muster. But if you examine it more closely, you will find, and this is one of the dimensions of the critique of pure reason, that have in general been very neglected, that by spontaneity, Kant is not really thinking here of the achievements of individual thought. If, God forbid, I were to solve some equation or other, or perform some other mental act of that sort, Kant would argue from within the theory of knowledge that such acts were simply the achievements or efforts of empirical consciousness within an already constituted empirical reality. What he understands by spontaneity is an activity, to be sure, but at the same time, and this is what is expressed by the dialectical nexus that I have been trying to explain to you, it is something involuntary. It is something that occurs without my being too clear about what is happening in the depths of the human soul, as Kant phrases it in the schem schematism chapter. The actual conceptual achievements, by which I mean the achievements thanks to which the world becomes for me the world in which our experience has its being, these achievements are not so much my acts, in other words, conscious activities, but are more like objective, involuntary functions that occur even before any particular mental activities have taken place within the world as constituted. You can see this at its clearest in the very mysterious concept that represents the first stage of the first version of deduction of the pure concepts of understanding, namely the concept of apprehension in intuition. Thus, the fact that something is perceived intuitively and retained in the mind as a unified entity coincides with what is an immediate passive given. Nevertheless, in his view, this process involves the intellect because the postulated unity is a substantive one. It goes beyond the merely formal determinants of time and place because it represents the organization of a specific perception into the thing that is perceived in it. Thus, both things are involved in Kant's concept of spontaneity. It means both the simple, straightforward concept of an activity and also the concept of an unconscious, or as we might put it, involuntary activity. I suggest once again that you should do what is always advisable in philosophy, namely to pay heed to the very simplest linguistic usage. In this instance, I would ask you to reflect on what is meant when we say that someone has acted spontaneously. If you reflect on it for a moment, you will see that this duality does, does exist. A person is spontaneous if he forms an action in a particular situation, but we only call his action spontaneous if it does not follow logically from prior considerations, but instead has something sudden or abrupt about it. We might even call it something indeterminate. You can see then that this peculiar duality of ego and impulse, which I can only imagine as something somatic, something physical, extends into the sublimest reaches of Kant's theory of knowledge and the incomparable greatness of Kant, I would remind you, consists in his ability to give expression to such complexities without regard to any particular thesis that he wishes to prove, simply by virtue of his fidelity to the facts of the case. I should like to add just one brief comment on this matter. You will undoubtedly find it surprising that post-Kantian philosophy, post-Kantian speculative philosophy in particular, in the development starting with Fichte, should have given Kant's own philosophy such a, stra such a strange turn. Kant believed that he had succeeded in defining our acts as our acts simply by analyzing the mental activities of human beings as they are, 
entirely in the spirit of English empiricism. Yet in the hands of post-Kantian philosophy, these acts became the acts of an absolute subject, and ultimately of the absolute as such. This absolute then turned more or less explicitly into the heir of the god who had been overthrown by nominalism. I believe that you will be able to see how things reach this pass if you reflect upon what I have attempted to explain to you today, unless you prefer to regard this development simply as a mere hypostasis, a hypostasizing abstraction from the activity of individual human subjects. What I have tried to clarify then is this element of feeling in our thought that our most profound acts, or so-called constitutive acts, are not those in which I am present as a thinking subject, but then but that an it is thinking in me, and that an it is at work mentally even before we may say that the ego has been constituted, and this feeling represents an age-old, at bottom, archaic experience. It is a feeling that makes possible the transition through which to constitute whatever it is that thinks in the individual mind as it constitutes our world, prior to all individual thought, and to constitute it as something not individual, but transcendental. By transcendental, I mean not something that formally comprises individuals, but something that actually establishes individuation and makes it possible. In the same way, the concept of the transcendental contains a memory of the transcendent, in other words, of a consciousness that should be more than merely individual consciousness. I believe that if you are willing to entertain these ideas, they will give you an entry into the mysteries of the concept of freedom, in which the extreme exaltation of the ego goes hand in hand, in a very strange way, with the abyss of the self. But over and above that, it will enable you to understand something of the motives underlying German idealism, and in particular what is meant by the depths of the human soul. It is here that you have to look to discover the sources of the concept of inwardness, in its specific meaning, a term that played a great role as early as Hegel, it is interesting to note that this concept of spontaneity is of central importance not just in Kant, but also in the Marxian theory of socialism. Moreover, both in Marx and more generally in socialist theory, it has the same dialectical quality, the same dual character that I have drawn your attention to in Kant. For the spontaneous action that Marx ascribes to the proletariat is supposed, is supposed on the one hand, to be an autonomous, free, rational form of action, action on the basis of a known and comprehensible theory. At the same time, however, it contains an irreducible element, the element of immediate action that does not entirely fit into the factors that theoretically determine it. And above all, it does not fit smoothly onto the determining factors of history. On the contrary, even though it is determined by these, it seems to be a way leading out of them. In extreme contrast to all mechanistic interpretations of the course of history, you can see from this, oh, sorry, period, course of history, period. You can see from this how this curious duality of spontaneity has continued to thrive until it finally underwent the strange fate, on the one hand, of simply vanishing. That is to say, it too succumbed to the blind conformity to dominant power relations. On the other hand, in the minds of all those who have opposed this development, spontaneity has made itself independent in a strange way and has split itself off from reason as a protest against a mechanical determinism through cause and effect, and this protest applied to the presence of that determinism in socialist thought too. In this way, it came close to anarchism, even though anarchism had been subjected to a stringent criticism in socialist theory. The greatest example of this protest is Rosa Luxemburg, but you will also discover traces of it in the thought of Jean-Paul Sartre, even though he has long since discarded any immediate application to politics. Thus, to sum up this part of the argument, the concept of spontaneity, which might be described as the organ or medium of freedom, refuses to obey the logic of non-contradiction, and is instead a unity of mutually contradictory elements. It points, therefore, to a strict conception of dialectic, when I told you that the ego had conceived the idea of freedom for egoistic reasons, this contained the idea that the ego has enormous difficulty in grasping the elements of its own dependency. This is not merely a matter of psychology which strives to keep narcissistic traumas at bay because they entail a loss of self-respect, but it arises, we might say, from the principium 
individuationist itself. As the human subject separates itself off and becomes a single sub, a single being, and defines itself as a single being, it must, of course, if it is to defend its individuality against others that crowd in on it, insulate itself against the consciousness of its own entanglement in general. In the Principium Individuationis, individuals or individual beings appear in a society that reproduces itself through conflicting interests, and this reinforces their tendency to blot this out, thus strengthening the individual's belief that he is merely a, a being for himself. You can picture to yourselves this remarkable connection between the semblance of freedom and what may be called the monadological, monadological fail. You can gain a clear idea of what is meant, and I try to the best of my ability to make these speculative concepts a little more concrete, not by means of examples, but by focusing on critical points, on contentious issues. You can best concretize the matter for yourselves. If you dwell on a pathological phenomenon for a few moments, one in which the ego becomes aware of its own nature as something determined in a perverse manner, I should add. I am thinking here of obsessional neuroses. These are psychological illnesses. In earlier days, we would have spoken of nervous disorders rather than proper mental illnesses or psychoses. People afflicted by them find themselves compelled to perform certain ritual-like actions without knowing why. If they fail to perform these actions, they are overcome by the most terrible anxieties and even physical pain. I am thinking here of the sleep rituals practiced by many neurotic people, in which they feel compelled to arrange their pillows in all sorts of complicated ways in order to get to sleep. And there are all sorts of other comparable obsessions. Incidentally, everyone has obsessions of this kind. I believe that if you think about it, you will all become aware that every individual has some obsession or other but they are not called obsessional neuroses unless they make it impossible for the individual to function properly in ordinary life or lead to really serious unhappiness. But that is a relatively arbitrary distinction. If you do suffer from such an obsessional neurosis, the way it works is that you give in to the obsession and then defend it with a huge expenditure of libidinal energy. You even look for reasons, often very absurd ones, to explain why you cannot manage without performing the obsessive actions concerned. But what these explanations have in common is that the obsessions are always seen as ego-alien, as psychology puts it. That is to say, you experience the obsession as caused by a dependence on something in oneself, but something that ought not be there. The significance of these obsessional neuroses is that they have at least torn a rent in what I have called the monadological veil. In other words, they teach people that they are not simply what they are in their own intrinsic nature, that alien elements enter into them, that freedom is denied them in what Hegel calls their native land, namely the realm of consciousness and of self. The feeling one has is that's not really me, and this feeling that is experienced when you are in the grip of an obsessional neurosis has both something illusory and something true about it. It is an illusion because the ego that we regard as something substantial and given turns out not to have an existence of its own, but to be highly precarious, and its vulnerability is deeply exposed by these neurotic experiences. On the other hand, however, the feeling is true because the ego knows that the possibility of its own existence is its true being, and it is against this that the obsession offends. I could put it this way. The human subject knows that the inner causes underlying his impulses are not part of himself. And where the human subject comes across these inner causes underlying his impulses, this realization collides with his own consciousness of himself. And this too is the expression of the real contradictoriness of freedom of which we are speaking. I should like to bring together everything that I have been telling you today by saying that the contradictions and antinomies of freedom that in Kant's view could be explained as the product of a wrong-headed use of reason are in fact antinomies that are inherent in the question itself. By this I mean that, in a very real sense, we are simultaneously both free and unfree. <laughs>